16th? Yeah. Or is it going to be pushed out? No. no. Can't. Oh. Well, now i got to stop this. Okay, so we left off yesterday with bolt torque. Well, I really just started it. Bolt oh, or nut torque. It's all the same. Well, got to reload. Should we wait? Okay, <laughs> i got to write a lot real quick. Here we go. <laughs> all right. Oh, boy. And just like always, I just write. Sometimes I write notes to myself, but if I don't tell you what it is, then I guess i got to. It screws up things. So aircraft. Aircraft mechanics must use proper torque. Well, you don't have to if you don't mind killing people and going to jail. That's up to you. There's always that option. But. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. I'm not the boss of you. I am a little. All right, so I know how you guys are. Somebody tell you to get the vaccine. I ain't getting it. Tell, you, tell me I don't have to. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, and we talked about this yesterday, and it's, it's sort of intuitive why it's so important. And, and of course, you know, auto mechanics. Um, uh, in, in reality, auto mechanics, they have my absolute respect because if you look at a modern car, right, it is so far advanced compared to what we're working on. It really is. The stuff we're working on is, especially in general aviation, it's like 1940s technology. Man, so auto mechanics, I mean, they have to know so stinking much. Um, the difference is we know a lot differently, and there's no room for error. You know, what's the worst thing that's going to happen if you forget to bolt a wheel on? Uh, I shouldn't say what's the worst that happened. I mean, veer off, go down a, you know... An embankment, you know, hit a bus and with a, you know, bunch of orphans, and so yeah. The, but you know, for the most part. You've thought about that quite yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I'm just I'm just wasting time here. All right, so you know you got to use proper torque. We talked yesterday about what happens when you don't. How how seemingly simple operations, how so seemingly simple it is to put a nut on and take a torque wrench and just twist it until it clicks and does the right thing. You think, well, how hard could it possibly be? You know, it should take you, what, a minute to explain that to us, Kevin. Put the bolt on, you look at the chart, we talk to the chart. You got to learn that uh, bolt size. Not the bolt size, yep. I have to take, it's like a drinking game. I have to take a sip every time we say that. All right. um, what you got in that? Peach tea, to be honest with you. All right. Now, I wrote this. This is, this is a, I don't know, I have to, like a Kevinism, I guess. Uh, we do not, do not use impact tools. Okay, you know what an impact tool is? Yep. Louder. So everybody gets it? Yep. Now, I say that, unless specifically... Specifically called for, and I think this is one of my test questions, called for in the maintenance manual. And it's kind of funny because I, I've mentioned many times that I grew up in the auto body industry, and when you're in the car industry, everything must is fast. Speed is everything. right? You bid a job, and the entire goal is to do the job twice as fast as what you bid, so you double the money. In fact, you know, most auto body mechanics are paid that way. They're paid uh, very different than, than we are. Um, for example, you know, if, if the job is to remove a bumper and a fender, paint them, put them back on, and the shop bids, let's just say, 20 hours to do it, you're going to get paid 20 hours. If you can do it in 10, you got paid for 20 hours. That's how you double your money. In aviation, I've never seen anybody do that. You know, they pay you by the hour to do a job. They'll say, well, it should take 20 hours to charge a customer. And if you do it in 20 hours, you're a hero. If you do it in 22, you're not. If you do it in 10, they'll ask what happened. Um, so, yeah, and, and I would get in trouble. Boy, if I had a wrench, uh, a ratchet, you know, click, click, click in my hand, and, uh, you know, boss would come along, I would get yelled at. Why do you not have an impact? You should always have an air. I want to hear air impact. I want to hear tools running from the impact. So it's not like I don't know, but I would get students all the time, especially in, in engines, you know, come to me. Let, me. let me tell you about this new modern miracle, Kevin, impact wrench. And then we bring them in, like, check me out. I'm so cool. I'm like, you know, it's not like I don't know. Um, 
the thing with an impact wrench is just as the name sounds, it does impact the bolt. And the way I see it is you have an impact every time that it hits. And so if you're trying to get to this torque right here, you've exceeded it at some point. And it's, it's not a really, I don't know, it's just not a precise way of doing something. And so I choose not to use them, but, man, you, but here's the funny thing. So I wrote this, and, and I've never seen anybody using impact wrenches in aviation until I went to light combing school. Guess what they use on engines? Sitting there right with them, putting them together. I'm like, I'll tell you, you're not going to see me doing it. Um, what about electric screw guns and such? I think I've talked about that. Um, you have to be careful around fuel tanks. It's almost expected. I think if you went to work at a place at a local shop doing an annual inspection and, and your first job is going to be taking off all these inspections, you know, panels, you're talking hundreds of screws and you're sitting there with just a screwdriver, you know, you're probably going to get yelled at, you know, you're taking too long. So they expect you to use a screw gun, but I don't know. You know, when I work on my own plane, you rarely see me using a screw gun. I don't use any. I use a, I use a ratcheting screwdriver. In fact, my daughter has a really cool one that it ratchets, but if you hold it in one spot and turn it, it turns five times the speed of your, your wrist. Uh, you got it. A cra it's a craftsman. It's like really cool. Um, yeah, I, I really like it. And the reason why is just, well, it's my plane. I want total control. I want to know exactly how tight that screw was. I don't want to strip out the screws. So I'm not going for time in my airplane. Nobody's yelling at me. In fact, I'll go slow just to have fun. But anyway, uh, we've talked about that. Just be aware that nothing gets me, especially in the shop, uh, more cranky than hearing somebody putting screws in. And just every time they get to the end of the screw, with a bit just jumping out, it's like, you're just rounding off every screw head there is. Yeah. Well, it's just like for, say, the plane that I'm the P3. Yeah. If you use a, a screw gun or say just a drill. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're they're gonna strip. I mean, yeah. Because they're so old and then they're rusted. Yep. So I mean, if you use some kind of power, I've had it so many times it just goes boop. Even when it's just a screwdriver. Yeah, and now you're not saving time. You got to drill that screw out, and that's like an hour, and then it breaks off. We talked about it yesterday, but it's like the nut plate that you ruined. Now you're trying to rivet a new one. Yeah, yeah. So even yeah, putting them back in, just the the feel, just like oh, that, just it didn't feel quite right. Back it off before you yeah. cross threaded it. There's just so many advantages to being an aircraft mechanic and and taking your time and using the right stuff. Um, something else. Oh yeah, so. That is a big part of our job is, is managing screws, especially on older planes, because they're older. Um, you know what a speed wrench is? Yeah. Okay, snap-on makes the worst because the handle looks like the end of a ratchet. Craftsmen's are better because they have a knob on it. And you get the ones with the knob and you get it right here in your shoulder and you lean into it and you actually move that handle back and forth, tight, loose, tight, loose, tight, loose, and it'll pop out. And, you know, good mechanics, they know how to do that. They'll soak the stuff in some sort of penetrating oil. They'll get one of those. They'll get in it. Yeah. We had, whenever we from the vet off the major maintenance, they would use the electric screw guns that we had to use the speed handles like you're talking about. <laughs> so we'd be over there like, okay, this one's just stuck. Just wait and get that out later. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you do all the other ones, leave that one. Uh, let's see. Um, so if I ask you on a test, the answer is we do not use impact tools unless specifically called for in the maintenance manual. That's the way I'm going to treat aircraft. I have impact. I mean, you don't see me using it on my airplane. Have you seen uh, them to see if you've said in the maintenance manual? I've never seen it, ever. But it could be. Um, so we use proper, proper torquing. I hope so. Torquing. Um, procedures and safety all hardware. Torquing procedures and safety. Most <laughs> all hardware. Now, what are the safeties? Cotter pin, safety wire, lock washers, power nuts, self locking nuts, yeah. Torque is based on bolt size 
and not the wrench size. Figure if I say it enough, maybe maybe this is the class that won't do it. Actually, I don't think I've had anybody do it in a while. They've hid it from me. Example, uh, an A and 4 should be torqued. T-O-R-Q-U-E-D, sorry about that. Torqued to, should be torqued to, should be torqued to a max of, let's see, what is the maximum? What's the maximum torque? 100, all right, so maximum of 100 inch pounds. The maximum of 100 inch pounds. That means actually 100 pounds on an arm, one inch. But you don't have to use a one inch arm. Uh, but if you use the wrench size, what size wrench should it be? 7 sixteenths. You would think the max torque is how much? Slight difference. 840 is 840 inch pounds. Oh, it's Oh, okay. <laughs> well, so you guys know where the magneto test stand is. Well, you guys have had engines have been introduced yeah. to the torque meter that's sitting there. Okay. And that is literally the machine that sat next to me on my bench when I built an engine right here. It was right there. I built engines right here. And so when I would take my wrench and I would say, okay, you know, I need to do 300 inch pounds. I got 300 inch pounds. Click, click, click. Yep, it's working great. And I come out of the engine, do 300 inch pounds. And I go 600 inch pounds. I just do a click over here. Yep, 600. And that's how I did it. And the way you calibrate it is down in the, that box. That box weighs 150 pounds. There is 150 seven pounds in there and so there's an arm 10 inches long and you put the weight on there and that's exactly how it works it's just an arm 10 inches and you put the weight on and you calibrate the scale oh, God, it's so simple it's so simple how do they calibrate the weight yeah. <laughs> by putting it on a scale, it on a scale? <laughs> how do they calibrate the scale divisions of weight to measure it's all okay let me see e uh, to achieve proper torque, we use torque <coughs> wrench. Okay, so to achieve achieve proper torque. And by the way, a lot, most aviation stuff is given to us in inch pounds, but a lot of times it's given you in foot pounds. So it just means a foot pound is just one pound on one foot. So you just do the math to convert back and forth. That's why inch pounds are torque. Yes. So if it's 100 inch pounds, it'd be a... 1,200. <laughs> <Right around. laughs> so, so you divide by 12. So if it's 120 inch pounds, it would be... Is it 10 foot pounds? Okay. Cheap proper torque. We use, we use a torque wrench. Torque wrench. I probably could pare down some of my wording here. All right, there are several different types. different types of torque wrenches. It must have been easier for me to go to school than for you guys because there wasn't as much out there. We had the click type, dial type, and the bar type. You have electronic types, that's one. So we have the click type. Never assume something. Okay, so 
the click type, I don't have one with me, but when you adjust the torque here, you will rotate this dial. There's usually a lock. You pull the lock down. You will adjust it and read the veneer scale. I can't help you with that. And then you gently pull, and you must hold it where this, this is called knurling, that cross-hatching stuff. You must hold it on the knurled end, nowhere else, and pull gently and evenly until it goes click, one click. It's just a breakaway. So it does a little breakaway, and then you're done. I had one student who just stripped out like 18 bolts. I'm like, what happened? I kept waiting for it to click, and it never clicked. And I'm like, I'm like click. I'm like, it clicks every time. Yeah, but I thought it just like kept clicking. Like, click, 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 click. I'm like, why would you think that? So there was a lot of damage that happened that day. <laughs> oh, that one stripped. Matt, that one stripped too. Matt, that one stripped. And it just kept going. I'm like, okay. Maybe after the second we could have stopped. Um, uh, so my favorite is the click type because you don't have to stare at the dial and it clicks it clicks and you're done i just feel that if you do it nice and even they're just very accurate and i used to calibrate um, torque wrenches because we had the machine people would send us their torque wrenches so i worked with a lot of different torque wrench people say what's the best one i will tell you this since i was building engines and this is before electronic torque wrenches snap-on made well all of their torque wrenches and, and i forget what their plus or minus was because they all have a um uh, a, a range that they're good for, you know, the accuracy. And, but there was this one series that Snap-on made. So Snap-on torque wrenches come in a plastic box, right? What color is that box? Red. Black. Black. Red. Usually red. Red, red or black. Mine came in a gold box. It was guaranteed like twice the accuracy of any other, pro I paid way too much for these torque wrenches. <laughs> and let me tell you, they were the biggest piece of crap because I had the machine to calibrate it. And I'd go, well, this isn't even, I sent one back to snap on like three times before they finally got it right. And so, whatever. But now it's, they're really good. I mean, I've had them for 20 some years and they just, they never need adjustment. They're always great. And by the way, when you're done with these, you're supposed to leave it setting on the lowest setting, not all the way back, the lowest setting. Like, so if this ended at 20, this is a foot pound, 20 foot pounds, you'd set it at 20 foot pounds, the lowest setting when you're done. So yeah, the click type, uh, I hate this particular one is like the worst torque wrench I think you could own um, because uh, it's not this, we have these um, and ours go from like zero to like 800 inch pounds. Or, it's like more than 600, I think. And they're short. And it's like, what the hell? Every time I see somebody just shaking because they're this long. It's like 600 inch pounds, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and you're trying to read the dial and it's, you're shaking. So this little needle is kind of shaking on there too. They're all out of calibration and uh, they're terrible. And also if you bump this dial and move it, then it's going to give you a wrong reading. Um, the one good thing about them is occasionally you will see something in a torque spec that will say torque to 600 inch pounds and hold for X number of seconds. You can't do that with a click type. Once it clicks, you're done holding. Uh, but I just feel like at least you got with the click type to the right torque. This one, it's like. It's going to tell me to hold it there. It's going to fluctuate. It is. It's plus or minus. Yeah. Why would you need to hold? To verify that you actually get um, the, the friction on it is, um, I guess the, it's like the friction that you got the proper torque. Because if you're a click type and you do it rapidly, you can be way off. I, I, I've showed you, I could show you on our machine. I go watch this. I want 600 inch pounds. I could do it so fast, you, I'll hit it at 300. You're like, oh. So it's just a way to do it. Okay, so that's the dial type. That's love, hate with those. Uh, the beam type. The beam type, I just happen to have one. They're so cool. Um, and as you move it, this beam right here stays put and the rest of it flexes and so it points to what you're doing. Now what's really cool about them is there's a pivot point right here. And so it pivots back and forth. And the way that you know that you're doing it properly is the beam, this, this fat beam does not touch the handle. And so you have to hold it just right. 
And if you've used this a couple times, it teaches you how to hold the other torque wrenches right. Because believe it or not, if you put kind of a twisting side load on it, it seems to affect the, uh, the torque. It's just the way you actually twist your wrist can make a big difference. You're twisting it versus actually just pulling down. Hopefully that made sense. Um, it really makes a big difference. And that's why I love having that torque machine here. And I'll tell you guys, practice, especially with the cylinder base wrench, because cylinder base wrench goes out, over, back, and in. Well, not in, but over. So it goes up, over, back. So it's still in line with this, but you have this bar way out here. People grab it here and do it. And I'm like, do it, go ahead, see what you're doing. And you realize you can add or subtract 25% of the torque for sure. Then there's the new digital. So my father-in-law, somebody gave him this particular one here, uh, a craftsman. And I think when it was still available, they quit making them. Uh, it was like 20 bucks a craftsman. I mean, they were just so stupid cheap. And so he gave it to me. I thought, eh, I'm going to give it a shot. And I brought it in here and checked it on our machine. It is absolutely phenomenally accurate. Dead balls accurate, to be exact. <laughs> Have I played that one for you guys yet? No, that's okay. Break time. All right, so, so the digital ones, they're surprisingly accurate. I'm like, wow. And, it, you know, it plays a little tune. It'll tell you the max torque. It'll tell you if you're holding it. It'll... You know, you can hear it coming, so it's audible and visual, and uh, I like them. Yeah. All right. So. Okay, so we have the click type. I talked about that. We got the, the dial type. We have the bar and the electronic. Uh, okay, I was going to talk about this, but it's in my notes anyway, so I'm really going to talk about it now. All right, all torque wrenches must be calibrated. All torque wrenches. Must be calibrated. Is that like once a year? All right, well, if you read 4313, which is that approved data? Nope. Nope, it says annually... When dropped, um, I've seen some that's dropped or abused. Don't abuse your torque wrenches or as per repair station manual. So I will tell you that the industry standard, if you asked 100 different mechanics, when should you calibrate a torque wrench, at least 98 of them would say, you must do it annually. And if you said, show me where it says that, out of those 98, 98 would say, I don't know. <laughs> the other two would know the answer, and that's why they wouldn't tell you annually. Um, so it's not written in like an FAR or anything like that. You have to do it annually, but some things just become the norm, the accepted. And I believe where this comes from is that when you have a repair station, so the FA loves repair stations and they're very helpful to get repair stations going usually because it really tightens your rules up and you have very specific things that you must do. There's a hierarchy of people and the training and how it's calibrated. They, they have their manuals that they have to go by that would say you should have your torque wrenches and everything in it calibrated every, every year. So that's kind of where that comes along. So um, I want to say somebody I know took their torque wrench in to get calibrated and actually asked the calibration station, why, why do you put one year on it? And they're like, well, because that's what everybody wants. He said, is there a law? No. Then put two. So I made the little sticker and put it on there. So next calibrate and two years out, right? Because you really can do that. Um, but the actual, you know, if you're more than a year, you're going to get questioned. Uh, no, if some of you drop it, just make sure nobody saw you. Um, and, but as per repair station manual. So if the repair station manual said, every, you're gonna, we're going to, if I had a repair station, I wrote in it, everybody's going to have their torque wrench calibrated every six months. Guess what? That's the rule in our shop. It's the law. It's it's it is law now, and you have to do it. So, but why, why are they so strict on 
repair station getting them calibrated and they could affect a lot of other things. All right, the world according to me. Um, if you're just an AMP out there working, then you're working under the FARs, part 43, um, what, 67, um, certification, and maintenance manuals in 4313. So you're working on a Cessna, and you've got a torque wrench, and you haven't had it calibrated. Well, what in those documents said that you had to have it calibrated? If the maintenance manual didn't say use it calibrated, then I guess you kind of don't have to. You're foolish not to, and, and if you choose that route, the FA is going to watch you very carefully. You're now a person of interest to them. They don't like people with that attitude. I don't blame them. All right, but I don't believe there's anything in writing where they could actually pull your ticket and say, you have violated the torque wrench law. Yeah, it's I more like... It is interesting. I do too, but I don't, this is me again. I don't believe you violated the torque wrench law and it's bad practice. And if we had an attorney in the room, I could, it would confer with me. There's a thing called, oh, uh, what is it? The prudent person? Yes, prudent person. Pr prudent person law. So if you, tell me if I'm wrong, and if you were in court because you did something <clears throat> wrong, they would compare that to a prudent person. Like we interviewed 10 different mechanics and they all said, we calibrate our torque wrenches every year. And you're like, well, I don't believe in that. Yeah, but they all do that. That's industry practice. You're kind of guilty. They use it a lot in medical malpractice. That's where I learned the term. Yeah, say that this is in this community, this is how you do it. It's been, it's been, it's been after decades. Yeah. And this doctor did it differently, but that's not the standard in this community. Yeah. It was negligent. Yep. I feel like that's one of the yeah. things that once I find the down and the added, they come to the conclusion. That's exactly how it works. Yeah. And that's why Phil is famous for saying, it's not a problem until it's a problem. Yeah, so someone dies, <laughs> and then it's in the everywhere. Yep, so nobody's going to come knocking at your door and ask to see your torque wrench calibration until the plane goes down. The plane and that's the first thing that I'm going to ask for, <laughs> you know. Um, again, according to me. So now, when you go to do your repair station, there, if you go to, oh my gosh, what is the FA website? F Sims, F, and we haven't talked about it. it's called F Sims, and you go into F Sims, I mean it is just oh man, it's like that is so much information. There's information on everything in the world you want, and that is the information that the FAA is now using to certify things. So you want to do a repair station? It's not just some FAA guy showing up and going, well, you know what I think would be nice if you did. <laughs> they're going to go into uh, their orders, the FAA orders. And they're going to read the order that says, oh, so you're, you're looking at Eric's repair station. He goes, repair station. These are the things that you should verify. You know, uh, what is his, his hierarchy of personnel? Um, down here it says um, calibration of equipment. You know, it says something like uh, the repair station should have all of the interval written down for all of the calibration of their shop equipment. You know, a recommended period. If it gives a recommended period, it'd be like a year. Maybe it won't. Now the FA guy has to figure it out himself and he's just gonna know, well, everybody does a year, so there you are. So when you get into repair station, you're bringing a whole bunch of rules down on top of you that you have to now live by that weren't out there before. Like for example, the repair station I worked at, we could not work on engines that were more than 450 horsepower. So as long as I'm working in that building under that repair station, I'm limited to 450 horsepower, which by the way is a Pratt & Whitney 985. I walk outside the repair station, pull out my A&P ticket, I can work on a 1340, which is much more horsepower. I can work on anything I want. Go back in the repair station, I leave my A&P ticket at the door, now I'm limited to 450 horsepower. Really limits you a lot, and really brings the rules down. But doesn't it also open, like, you can do more? You can do more, just like, go back like here. I could never, ever, Reface a rocker arm as an AMP. Go to my repair station, bring me rocker arms, I'll reface them. It's legal for me because I wrote an op spec on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think the repair station is the way to go. I would say the opposite. Okay. I feel like the more it sits in your in your toolbox not being used. So what I would do is, especially the first few clicks of the day, they're cold, they've been sitting in your toolbox. You can do a couple clicks on it and you see, it's not accurate, a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. There it is, now she's working. Yeah, she's working. 
Yeah, before that. Well, my big one's the girl, the smaller one's the boy. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, proper procedure is needed, so. Would that make uh, electro electronic ones just kind of a lot more accurate if you replace the whole system without really any springs that you're using? I think they still have, oh, they have load transducers in them that are solid state, probably. I'm guessing. I don't know for a fact. I was not, I never calibrated electronically. electronically, except for the one I own when I brought it in. I'm like, oh, this thing is really stinking accurate yeah. uh, for proper torque. Proper torque. Again, it's something that you think that is so simple that how hard could it be? And yet, so many mechanics don't do it right. And you might as well just not do it at all at that point. Um, so hold the wrench properly. Hold the wrench. Hold it properly. So, so going back here, looking at this one, you have to hold it in this area right here where it's designed to be held and you can't be putting your hands on anything else. Sometimes I see people really holding the head of these things or just doing weird things, especially if it's got a, a like a cylinder base wrench or something, adding torque, subtracting torque with the other hand. Be careful. You also have to support it. You know, if you use a long extension, that adds, uh, it absorbs some of the torque that you're putting into it. So you have to consider that. Uh, where's it gonna go? Yeah, this one is cool because you gotta hold it so that the, the little fulcrum or it, is perfect and it doesn't touch the side. Yeah. So do you hold the head when you're holding it? Do I what? Do you hold the head when you're Yeah, yeah, I do. Like if I had a, an extension, I would hold it like right here, just kind of support it. Yeah, but, but um, I see people actually grab it and they're pulling with their other hand or something. I'm like, no, don't do that. But yeah, I wouldn't walk up and just, you know, one hand behind and do that. No, that's, you, you gotta. Can we bring that one into class tomorrow? Sure. Okay, this one right here, see, this is knurling right there. That's what it's called. And you're supposed to, your effective torque should be right there. And it also tells you how many inches it is from here to that point right there. That's probably a 10 inch. But you should be holding it right there in the middle. In a perfect world, it's at that spot. I mean, it's like you put your finger between those two neurals and pull right there. You usually can't do that, but so I'll hold it and put these two fingers like right there in the middle. And so that it's dead in the middle. And that one's easier because it's got more grip space. And it's longer. Yeah, make sure you, you pick the right one. If you're picking something and it's too short and you can't properly, don't use it. Just stop. Go, this, you know, this doesn't work for me. This is not a, a good, I'm not putting a good torque on it because this torque wrench is not adequate. So ask for a better one. Um, all right. Hold the wrench properly. Um, apply steady and even pressure. Don't jerk it. Oh, I actually wrote that. <laughs> uh, do not jerk. Don't be a jerk, because it'll just click really easy. Um, as best you can, as best you can, do not stop and start. Easier said than done. Because especially if you're working on engines and you're doing cylinders, you can only move the cylinder base nut a few degrees at a time because there's so much stuff in there. Move it like like quarter of a turn and then you pick it up. Yep, and that, there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing you can do about it. But if there is something you can do about it, like it's a bolt right out in the middle of the open, then I make sure that I start and have plenty room to go all the way around. Now, of course, there are things that you are torquing. And I'll be honest with you, it's not really what I would call hypercritical, like most stuff on an engine. Um, all the through bolts, the cylinder bay, I mean, that stuff is very important. And I, if I worked on helicopters, I'd probably have more to tell you. But, you know, when I'm working on the brakes on my airplane or wheels, and I have to, the way you take a wheel off of smaller Cessnas is you have to cut the safety wire and there's two bolts that hold one of the brake pieces on. 
and you pull that out and then the whole wheel and brake assembly comes off as one. So you put that brake uh, lining back on there and, and uh, they're torqued, I think 110 inch pounds or something. And that's, that's, you know, that's not a real critical thing. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that most people in the shop just, you know, just use a quarter inch ratchet and go, eh, click. You know, they made a little click sound with their mouth. Um, I don't because I don't know. It's like, it's not that stinking hard for me to use a torque wrench and do it right. You know, and I do, I say that, to, you know, we're all human and it's just, you're sitting there, it's like, yeah, I gotta get up again and walk, you know, on the ground and gotta get this done. And then it, that's the time when you just have to say to yourself exactly what Eric said. Am I really that lazy that I can't do this right? And then, you know, kind of answer my own self, like, if I am, it's time to go home. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Well, yeah. In, in the Coast Guard, when I was doing uh, any kind of torquing, uh, you had to go and get the QA, check the torque with him before you actually do something. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, I can understand like, someone being like, oh, man, it's just taking up so much time. But at the same time, it's like, you need to do this. You need to like, torque it. Or you can just get the torque range and just do it yourself. But then it's the, the, the QA can sign it off. Yep. But even Costco, when they put tires on, they always have to double check. Well, that's kind of cool. But, all right. So yeah, don't don't be don't be lazy. As for stopping and starting, um, I know whenever we had to use the torque wrench, they didn't want you to like start from just hand tight and just keep going with the torque wrench like from start to finish. They just wanted you to do it like the last couple of. Okay, so there's a lot to that. So let's just say I have, well, like, if, if I'm doing, if I, like homing has a, a crank gear, it's a gear that goes on the back of the crankshaft. If that gear comes loose, everything stops. So it's the most critical bolt in the whole engine. It's one bolt that holds it on. Okay, so would I then use a regular ratchet to get it close, then go get a torque wrench and then finish it? Never. Well, probably not. I mean, if it's just sitting right there anyway, I'm like, yeah, I'll just get it kind of just past finger tight. Then I'll go get my torque wrench and finish it. If my torque wrench is laying there. I'm just going to pick up the torque wrench and just go nice, smooth, click, one shot. All right. But now let's look at if I had something that I'm bolting on that is got four. Okay. And let's just say I needed to go to 600 inch pounds go inch lb inch pounds okay i'm not going to go 600 then 600 okay that is wrong 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 so even though i say try not to start and stop even if the manual doesn't tell me to do it i'm going to go finger tight finger tight finger tight finger tight um maybe maybe a little bit of a wrench but then i'm going to go okay if it's 600 i'd probably go i'll make up something like 200 inch pounds and then I'm gonna go this one then this one then that one then I'm gonna go to two three probably 400 and again I would you know maybe start here that one that in a star pattern so always do the one that's furthest away when you get to this one you can do either either side um, then I'll go to 600 so I'll step it up to three and you are starting and stopping at that point but you can't just do one and then do the next like if you're Man, the worst in the world is I is if you're working on wood propellers. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. And a wood propeller's torque, it's really light. I want to say it's around 200 inch pounds max. So if you did this one to 200 inch pounds, then did this one to 200 inch pounds, did this one to 200 inch pounds, you might as well throw the prop weight at that point because it's going to be sitting crooked on the airplane. At that point, you'll have crushed the... So it's... You know, it's this one, then 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 that one. And I'll do it three different times just to get to 200 inch pounds. Finger tight, 100 inch pounds, and 200 inch pounds. Yes? Uh-huh, they do. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good about it. But what they're not good about is maybe the manual will say one thing, but then there's a service instruction that tells you how to really do it. Like, why do you two can't get together on this, you know? It's like, this is kind of the, 
C method of doing it. But if you really want to do it right, you need this book over here. All right. I'll show you this. Hold on. Lightcoming direct drive engine overhaul manual. This covers every single Lightcoming engine from the 0235 all the way up to, I don't think they cover the big eight cylinder, that one's on its own, but 540 cubic inch. Okay, there's there's your manual. That's it. There's your manual. There. Boom. Here's the service bulletin set. That looks more familiar. This is where the information is really stored. Now, if you're going to work on a light coming, it's going to be a typical mechanic. Well, I'm going to torque a cylinder, so I'm going to skip all this crap right here. Maybe I'll go over here and find cylinders, pistons. Oh, that's uh, section six. We'll go to section six. Now, we don't want to read section six. We just want to kind of thumb through it real quick. Oh, yeah, the assembly must be near the rear. We'll just, oh, there we go. Here's my torque. Set it down and get to work, right? Remember all that crap? How are we just going to skip that crap? <laughs> to the owner of this manual, you. In addition to this manual and subsequent revisions, additional overhaul repair information is published in the form of service bulletins and service instructions. The information contained in these service bulletins and service instructions is an integral part of and is to be used in conjunction with the information contained in this overhaul manual. So what does that say? You if you bought this and the FA shows up and says, where's your manual? Right here, it's brand new. <laughs> Let's say you're forgetting anything. Nope. <laughs> There's just some stuff on here. Page one, skip that. And right there, it starts with the... You know, table of contents. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of says that that's included, <laughs> doesn't it? So, all right. That was a soapbox. Okay, it was break time. Huh?